Hello, everybody, and welcome to our day early comic review show. I'm Jason. I'm Andy. And we're with Infinity Flux Comics out of Chattanooga, Tennessee. So every Tuesday, once we got the comics and we bag and board them, we divide them up and we read them, and then we bring these kind of snippet reviews of each one to, to the internet, to everyone who watches. Mm -hmm. Uh, we like to tell you more than the solicitation will tell you, but we try not to spoil the whole book. We'll tell you if there's a major first appearance or something major, but more than that, we're just trying to describe these books so that the right people can know which ones they want to pick up and read mm -hmm. when they go to their store next. So um, I know it's a holiday week, at least for many people, uh, most of us in the U.S. and many across the world, but the show must go on. Comics are still coming out. They, they, they are. In fact, I dare say this is a pretty decent size week. I mean, look at some of the books that we're going to go over here. We have many more to the side. We'll also be showing variant comics. So without further ado, what's the first book you're going over, Andy? Yeah, I feel like, uh, especially Marvel this week was like, hmm, people after they get done with all their family stuff may have a little extra time. They might want to sit down and read some uh, extra size comics this year or this uh, this week because I've got some big ones. So starting off is Avengers Forever number one, and look at all those Avengers on the cover. There's enough of them to cover forever. Yes. So uh, this is uh, kind of spinning out of Avengers 50 from a few weeks ago. We got a little hint to um, what's going on in this, but this actually takes place in. Uh, are on Earth 818. So as opposed to uh, the main Marvel Universe, which is uh, Earth 616, this is, I guess, 200 away from that one. Um, this starts off with a pretty uh, desolate landscape, which is funny. At first I was like, is this the world of um, Old Man Logan? Because uh, it right. very much looks that way, and it's kind of setting up um, what was kind of the last hero to fall on this world? Well, if you read Avengers number 50, you know that Ghost Rider was, uh, this is the Robbie Reyes Ghost Rider, was pulled from the main Earth to somewhere, that turns out to be this one, by a Deathlock. So this kind of picks up in the future with a version of Tony Stark called the Ant-Man. And he is the Earth's last archaeologist. It is the, like, you know, you've got your one layer of separation of, like, oh, you've got uh, Spider-Gwen, and then you've got uh, uh, the Deadpool version, what's her name? Um, Gwenpool. Gwenpool. It's like, how many layers beyond the original one can we get? So this is Tony Stark as Ant-Man... Um, who's an archaeologist, and he is kind of the last um, hope for this world. Um, you'll have to see if that is true for this. But he is looking for um, an item that's basically like, maybe this can help save us. I won't give it away. The beginning of the issue kind of shows what this item is. But he is being pursued by war machines, which are kind of the... Uh, drones of this world that he admits that he might have had a hand in making initially. But, um, so you get kind of a good view of this version of the world when Ghost Rider busts in and it all goes down. This is definitely a setup issue, kind of giving you familiar with this version of the world, which I still don't have a full, great grasp of. I'm not sure um, who's left and all of that, but... It was a really fun read. Um, there are sites saying that this is a first appearance of Agent Carter. Now, the only thing to that is on the cover, I, I would try to point it out, but she's she's somewhere in the big group of people. Um, that's the only place she appears is on this A cover. She's not in the issue. Um, and... But you do get some first appearances of characters like that. The kind of Elseworld what-if versions of characters, which are pretty cool. We don't know a whole lot about them yet, but you'll have to read it to find out. And there's kind of a uh, post credit sequence in this issue as well, where you learn um, some other players that may be coming into this story. So I think this is really fun. This is Jason Aaron and Aaron Cooter doing it. 
I don't think you have to have read the main Avenger series to really understand what's going on it doesn't other, sound like other it. than the Ghost Rider bit, but it's kind of like he's just as confused as everyone else is about what's going on. So, yeah, really fun first issue. I'm looking forward to the next issue because I feel like we'll get some more backstory on this world. Um, but at least the parts about Ant-Man, Tony Stark, I thought were really fun, and his backstory is really neat. So I would I would definitely recommend this one, especially I feel like this is going to be like first appearance galore series. Maybe not in this first one. We do get a couple of them, but going forward, we're going to get a lot of them. So we've got a few variants for this. We've got the Medea Scalera variant with kind of other versions of characters you can see on there. Then we have, of course, the Dodderman variant. This That's time awesome. with all the Scarlet Witches. That's great. They made that a nice open order one so you yes. can get it. And then finally we have the Pacheco um, variant. This is a 1 in 50 remastered variant with a ton more characters on it that we are selling to our customers for $45. But yeah, um, there is a lot of good DC that I'm going to be talking about later. There's a lot of good indie books I'm going to talk about later. But like Andy said, it's a bit of a Marvel week. Yeah. And I would say even outside of comics, you know, with the Hawkeye mm -hmm. series going strong on Disney Plus mm -hmm. with some strong, you know, last few episodes and the big reveal villain i can't <laughs> say because not everyone's seen it yet yeah that they bring back i'm so happy they brought back that particular villain in that yeah. particular way <laughs> and then of course with spider-man no way at home being out it's like all everyone's talking about is marvel mm -hmm. this week so I, I think with the comics they're like let's go ahead and just launch a, yeah. a ton of great books so the first one i'm going to go over is venom issue three another one written by ram v this is another good issue of Venom. The first thing to say, and if you read one or two, you know this, but the Life Foundation is back. I think that's a good idea. The Life Foundation has so many roots with the symbiotes. And after everything with Null, it's like, where do you go from here? You know, let's go back to them. Let's go back to um, people of Earth trying to deal with these symbiotes. Mm -hmm. The problem is the Life Foundation, sure, they're against the symbiotes, but are they for mankind? Or are they for weaponizing them? <laughs> They've never been good people. But they are back in a big way in this book. And you'll get to see what they're up to, what they're doing. There's a first appearance of a new character who... It, it's not like he's part of them. It's like he's a contractor. He's going to be working for them. His name is Mr. Carson. And there's a first appearance of a super-powered suit called the Spearhead. So that's some stuff I know people are going to want to know, mm -hmm. people who like to pick up first appearances. This could be a big deal. Um, you know, let's think back. The last Venom series, issue number three, that was a very <laughs> big deal. So that's funny, yeah. Who, who knows? I, I don't know if they're trying to do some sort of parallelism to that or whatever. Beyond that, there's still the mystery of Eddie's death. That thickens more. For instance... Could it have been foretold? Did somebody know about it? And if somebody knew about it, how? How would they have known about this? Especially if it's a good person. You'll have to read to see. And, um, you know, so now Dylan is just with the symbiote and, um, of course, the cat symbiote as well. And there's a strain on the relationship between Dylan and Venom, though. Um, you know, Dylan doesn't have a dad again. And Venom, you know, every time he looks at him, what does he think about? His dad. So that that's sort of an issue that goes on in this. Meanwhile, there, there's a lot in this issue. There really wow. is. Yeah. Uh, Eddie's reporter friend is continuing his work with, with Dylan. Um, it's a she, mm -hmm. but is continuing Eddie's yeah. work with, with Dylan. Uh, however, there is a major betrayal this issue. Watch for this betrayal. And um, I, I think that sums up a little of what's going to be in this. So another very strong issue of Venom. It At the gate, it was really good, and they're really keeping it mm -hmm. very eventful, which I like a lot. Yeah. So uh, here is the Rice Devil's Reign variant. we got a few of these to 
show off today. I guess that one's the leader mixed yeah, with Venom, which is with weird. Venom. Mm -hmm. And then here is the 1 in 25 by John Boy Myers that we are selling to our customers for $40. Really nice one. Venom hasn't really used those chains too much yet. So Just far, they're more, you with they're more decoration. <laughs> I want to see him and Ghost Rider get in a battle and they get all tangled they get up. Tangled up. They get tangled up. Tangling both their chains. Okay, I did want to mention real quick um, that we did have Avengers issue 51 come out. So where uh, Avengers Forever went kind of one direction. This is following the other story with that new um, multiversal Masters of Evil super cool you see a lot of them in here but i didn't get a chance to really read it so i just wanted to show you this did come out so you don't want to miss that one but my next one is super cool i enjoyed every second of this book this is king conan number one um this is going to be a six part mini series by jason aaron and uh mahmoud asrar the original team when marvel got the rights to conan back that was the your your first team on there and this is kind of a continuation of that um but not where you had to have read it it's just you know you get kind of the tone and everything of that original run but if you don't know king conan is the it's funny to say the future version this is not like flying cars or anything but this is him later on in life after he has taken the throne of aquilonia and uh, has, he's been in that role for quite a while now, and he kind of grows restless. Um, he was kind of born to be this adventurer and this barbarian. And so he is setting off on a, uh, a trip, a boat ride, whatever, on a ship. Um, and that's where we actually pick this, off, pick this up. We, um, he kind of explains what's been going on. But where this starts, he has washed ashore of a, an island a deserted island but this is not this is not a paradise island this isn't palm trees and and golden sand no this island is littered with bodies of other adventurers and um, sailors people he says from all over um, Hyboria hmm. so it are already kind of uh, it's him kind of trudging through a graveyard that's you know black stone and sharp and broken ships a, a beautiful visual i mean super cool also he has a plethora of swords he can take from so he just constantly reaches down and rips one out of somebody and, and walks with that one but on this island he is uh not alone he's confronted by one of his oldest and most evil villains and it's a very like uh you know you you have that feeling of like this is probably their final fight oh. really cool feeling of it very uh I, I made a note about how well choreographed this was mm -hmm. i like it when the fights travel you know this guy hits this guy he falls off of a of a pier okay now they're in the ocean they're fighting in the ocean oh a sea monster comes by one of them like uses the sea monster to hit somebody else it's that constant like as they're they're bickering and stuff they're they're using the environment um, to fight each other. But the, the whole issue is kind of this fight, but it's a very revealing fight about uh, Conan, what he's kind of his current uh, mindset of not being happy being a king anymore, about uh, what's been going on with his family, and then this villain that I won't give away, but their kind of final great plan to conquer the world and take out Conan. Um, but some weird stuff is also showing up on this island. Some uh, snow panthers from the far reaches of uh, Hyboria and some other weird like jungle cats from somewhere else. And how did they all get to this island? Um, not even a spoiler to say that he does bring up the fact that like maybe I'm dead. Maybe mm. this is the afterlife. Um, but he's like... I will, uh, I will live the afterlife the same way I lived in life with, with cold iron in my hand. Just some of the great Conan writing of just, you know, a juggernaut of a, of a person. Just, I will fight through whatever. Um, super fun. It does build kind of this mystery of where are they? 
uh, what is coming next because there there's kind of a twist at the ending. Um, the art is great. The writing is great. Jay Singer has such a um, a voice for that like uh, high speech of ancient lore and everything that is so much fun. But highly recommend. Probably if I did have a pick of the week, it might be King Conan because it was a it was a fun, quick read that you just want to read again. Um, also, some great variant covers for this. We've got a Hans variant. We've got a Stan Sakai variant. That's awesome. Yeah, it just it's so cool to see Sakai drawing Conan. I would take a whole. I'm whole glad book they're of that. getting Sakai just to do yeah. his versions of different things. We got the Savage, very regal Conan, probably the best he ever looked, the most clean and put together. And finally, we have the Garson variant. You've seen those before with all the little pictures making up the bigger picture. That is King Conan number one. Okay, so a lot of great Marvel books out this week, but if I had to pick my pick of the week, it would actually be this book. Nightwing number 87. Ooh. Oh, how I have waited for this book. So <laughs> here's the deal with this one. You probably have heard about it. If not, you'll, you got to check it out. It is all one continuous image. So you see how there's even on the cover, there's like multiple Nightwings. So if you were to take this comic and lay out the pages in a row, the story would just read from left to right. Mm -hmm. And so you see him moving across the page. There's a lot of action. So some of the pages will have multiple night wings, but that's okay. It makes sense. It's where your eye is looking mm -hmm. at the time. That's where he's at and that's what he's doing. And it follows that timeline. I don't know if there's any comic that has done an entire issue like mm -hmm. that. I tried to look into it. It didn't seem like it. I know some comics have had parts like that and things close to it. Yeah. But I think this might be one of the only times... Of course, written by Tom Taylor with art by Redondo, who is just the right person to do something like this. They've been kind of doing that on covers for a while. Yeah. And finally they said, let's do a whole issue this way. So for that alone, you know, hats off to them. Just for that alone, I'm very, very impressed. But on top of that, Tom Taylor is always going to have a cool story going mm -hmm. on as well. So continuous image issue. And uh, somebody has put a hit out on Dick Grayson. And I'm not talking about Nightwing. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about on Dick Grayson. So uh, a few issues ago, he inherited a lot of money from, from Alfred. Alfred, R.I.P., of yeah. course. Why did they kill off Alfred? <laughs> um, and he declared that he was going to use all this money to clean up Bloodhaven. Well, of course, the powers that be at Bloodhaven, which is run by criminals, don't like that. So all of a sudden now, Dick Grayson's on their radar. So uh, it hits out on him in his you know, real form. So we get to watch him dodge bullets, and you get to see every single bullet, you know, because yeah. this is like him running away. It's like, oh, they tried to shoot him here, and he ducked behind this. <laughs> they tried to shoot him there, and he jumped up here. Oh, and how is he going to turn into Nightwing without being seen? You get to see, you know, he gets to a darkened alley, and where does he go? <laughs> and it's really cool if you slow, if you take this issue slowly. You got to slow down and really enjoy mm -hmm. what they have crafted here. Otherwise, it can go by way too quickly. Um, so, more than that, there is um, a dog napping of his dog. We, we kind of learned they? about this previous issue. Yeah, his dog, of course, her name is Haley. She was a stray that he he got. But she also has a secret identity, and he says it again this issue, that she's Bitewing. <laughs> I think that's great. The dog has yeah. the, the two identities. Um, there's also more of Nightwing and Barbara Gordon as Batgirl in action together. Really great to see Barbara Gordon actually you know, out in the mm -hmm. field and with him again as their relationship has grown. And, uh, I mean, more than anything, it is just a lot of fun trying to piece together all the action. You'll see a page and there'll be so much action on it, but I promise you, if you take a moment, you look left to right, bottom to top, it all makes sense and you will, it, it, you know, it fills in all those gaps we, used to have to, we usually have to fill in when we're reading comics and we don't yeah. have that much. So, um, really awesome issue. 
I, I don't think they're going to do another one like this anytime <laughs> soon. I can't imagine what kind of planning and effort went into this one. So just for the attempt, it won my pick of the week. So uh, it also it has, at the end of it, there's a sneak preview to Batgirls number one. And I know that came out, you know, <laughs> last week, but I guess, you know, this one got pushed back. And so this preview they're offering is a comic that's already out. But maybe you didn't get to read Batgirls number one. So that preview is still on the back of it. And then we have this Jamal Campbell variant for it. Every, every Bat family member has to sleep at some point, so uh, why not show it on a cover? Yep. At least he's not drooling. <laughs> <laughs> so next is issue two of Justice League Incarnate. This is the big um, book from DC, the, the heavy in DC mythology book um, that is exploring the events after... Uh, what was the book called? <laughs> Infinite Frontier. In, Infinite, Infinite Frontier. Frontier. Yeah. There's so many infinites in and all of that. Multiverses. Multiverses. And, yeah. um, if there's one thing that Marvel and DC both are really into right now, it's multiverses. Yeah. So keeping everything straight is is a little <laughs> bit of a challenge. Um, but with this one, we are following the Just League Incarnate, which is a team put together from different realities, and they are trying to hunt... Dark Side, who has uh, found a rip in the multiverse, and if he can get beyond it, there's no telling what kind of terror he can unleash. So the Justice League Incarnate, led by President Superman, and what they kind of coin in this is Doctor Batman, because it's uh, Batman's dad, the Flashpoint Batman. But of course, they're not going to call him Flashpoint Batman. So someone refers to him as Doctor Batman because he was, of course, a doctor. Which he immediately is like, "Don't call me that." Um, they are chasing through dimensions and through boom tubes that uh, Darkseid opens up. But what's cool about that is, and they kind of teased it in the first issue, that every world they go into is going to have an artist um, that fits that style. So in this one, they are led into Earth thirteen which is the spooky universe, I don't know how better to say it, um, that is drawn by Joe Kelly. And it is uh, the most Nightmare Before Christmas, Halloween Town version of the DC Universe. Of course, when they come through, the, come through the portal, they land in a graveyard, and there's mausoleums, and people are hanging out in the mausoleums, and that's where a bar is, is like in a grave and everything. And, I don't know. The, it's really cool to see the entire tone of the book shift based on the world they're in. I think it was a very smart decision. But also on the outside of this, there is the heroes that are left inside of the House of Heroes, which is kind of their uh, Hall of Justice, as it is being attacked by Darkseid's parademons and uh, Calabac, Darkseid's brother. And so you see that team of heroes defending it. So this is a very, like, you're not getting any normal versions, no regular Earth versions of characters. You're getting all of the Earth 2 or 3 versions of these characters. But it's really fun if you've kind of been invested in those. It's cool to see them really fleshed out, especially Captain Carrot. Captain Carrot's got a really uh, fun s little story arc in this one, too. He doesn't really like the scary world, <laughs> and he has to uh, be comforted by someone. Uh, that's all really fun. But some uh, big stuff happens where maybe uh, with this multiversal traveling, what happens if they go through one and get split up into other worlds individually? What might happen with that and what fun combinations to, could come of it? So another great issue of Just League Incarnate. I'm interested to see what the end game of this is, um, what this might be leading to, because how many versions of the multiverse can we go outside of only to discover it's a bubble and a vast sea of bubbles that are made up of other bubbles. We've seen that so many times. So, uh, But they're really hinting at something going on on the kind of outer edges of the Omniverse. So definitely a, a cool one to keep an eye on. And if you're a big fan of the kind of DC mythos and the multiverses and all the weird versions of characters, this is a really good one. So Justly Incarnate number two and 
we are actually sold out of the variant for it now. So, but you do see Super Demon is in it, which is a just a great character. Yeah, the multiple artist idea is really cool. So Andy showed me some of the art when they go to the spooky. It's version, it's really say, fun. You, know. you get that version of um, Constantine, who is more of a superhero. Uh, he's got a cape and everything, but it's it it still works in that. It, it's really cool. Constantine has to be careful not to accidentally catch his cape on fire with all the smoking he does. <laughs> oh, he does he does quite a bit of that. Okay, so I read House of Slaughter number three, the latest from James Tynion in his offshoot series. So it's all about Jay Slaughter and Aaron Slaughter. That's what the series has been about since the first issue. And uh, so this is, like the other ones, it's told between present day and 15 years ago. So present day, you have Aaron, who is tasked with hunting down and killing Jace, his, you know, f even more than friend. And um, 15 years ago, you get to see where did Jace come from, because he came from another house and he joined the House of Slar. This was the previous issue. And how did their friendship come about exactly? And, and how close of friends are they? A lot of that gets revealed in this issue. And so, you know, usually when you're reading a comic and it, it does the flashbacks, you'll be in the one time and then you'll be in the other. This one tries to meld it at parts. Hmm. You know, some parts of it are you're in the one time, then you're in the other because it's relevant to one or the other. But then towards the middle of the issue, Tanya does this really cool thing um, where the one timeline it'll end with a line that'll pick up on the next timeline across a spread well, wow. i was pretty impressed with that that's a and, pretty uh, uh acrobatic storytelling yeah and it reads good that way too you know and i i like that i like a good story but i like an artfully told story mm -hmm. so i think that was my favorite thing about the issue however my second favorite thing is we keep learning more and more about the house of slaughter they talk about a civil war that went on previous to all of this and i'm very interested to hear more of and tiny knows what he's doing so let's say he's that's gonna be hooked. another series yeah. called like uh civil war or house of slaughter <laughs> he's got his hook to know what happened during this civil war time period beyond that in in the present time where um aaron is hunting jace uh they have to save a little girl you know after all it is their job to fight these monsters so they didn't forget about that you get some real good action scenes but then in the 15 years ago, you get to see them sneak out of House of Slaughter together um, to go have a little bit of fun. And you get to find out more about their past, particularly Jace's. And you get to see exactly how close together they've grown. Then it thrusts you back to the present where you're wondering, how is Aaron possibly trying to hunt and kill Jace when we just saw mm. how close they were back then? So really well done storytelling. Uh, another good issue of House of Slaughter. So here is the blank variant. Here is the Deladera variant. Then we've got the Virgin 1 in 25 Deladera variant for 30 bucks. Same cover, just no trade dress. You get to see the full darkness, darkened sky. And then here is the one per store Sheehan variant we're selling for $15 with a creature that I promise you will see if you read the issue. That's definitely an alleyway. If you glance down it, you, you don't want to walk down with that thing in the background. The alleyway is funny enough more from the past. The creature's actually in the present part of the story. Wow. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. So my next one is a new Miss Marvel series. This is Miss Marvel. Beyond the Limit, number one. This is just a mini series, um, but I feel like this is a good uh, refresher for some people who maybe haven't read much Miss Marvel before, um, because she does a little bit of explaining about who she is. It kind of takes her out of her normal element, and you you get to explore that. But this one is interesting. So uh, Kamala Khan is on vacation in Chicago with her cousin uh her cousin is uh razia and she's just gonna chill out you know not do superhero stuff but you know that maybe doesn't yeah. work uh also because her cousin is a scientist who works with um like uh 
quantum physics and wormholes and has some questions to Kamala about, uh, you know, all the scientists, people she knows, like Janet Van Dyne and all of those. So it's uh, it's funny, I mean, because the whole time you're reading this and be like, this is not a place you go for vacation. Like, this is going to go bad. Well, something happens while Razia is at work and Kamala has to um, go and superhero up and try to save her. But it turns out Razia is working on a device, we don't know much about it, that someone was trying to steal. And when Kamala touches it, she sees a multiverse of Miss Marvels. So this is really cool because you get to see, which I always love, but again, we've got more multiverse, different versions of Kamala in different realities, different costumes, maybe different powers, different looks, everything really cool. Um, but maybe that Flash wasn't just showing her something. Maybe it affected the world she's in. Or did she get pulled to another world? You'll have to read it and see. Um, it, it talked a lot about it in the solicitation. But I think it's kind of such a uh, funny reveal when you get to it. That if you haven't read the solicitation, I don't want to ruin it. So this is fun. It's kind of a Miss Marvel multiversal tale. Uh, you get kind of a guest appearance by a character on the last page that... Uh, may have something to do with some multiversal stuff. Uh, but it's really cool to see, you know, punk Kamala Khan and all these different versions of her from different realities. I want to see sumo wrestler Kamala Khan. Maybe you'll get like some that. real just out there <laughs> ones. So got some cool variants with this one. We've got the Bustos variant, which has Miles Morales on it. But really, Miles is only in, there's a one point where she is actually at the Bean in Chicago and looking at the reflection and in the reflection she kind of uh, pontificates about all of her different versions within the one reality. You know, she's uh, a daughter and a sister, but also uh, part of the champions, yeah. but teams up with Miles. And she's kind of exploring the multiple versions of her and then later we see the multiple versions of her in multiple realities. So that's the only little time you see Miles is in that reflection. We've got the Peach Momoko variant. Really cool. Is it a giant fist or is it just close to the camera? Both can be true with Miss Marvel. Of course. We got a Scotty Young this time. For sure that's a big fist. And lastly, we have the 1 in 25 Dodson variant, really nice, that we are selling for 40 All right, also from Marvel, speaking of younger heroes, I read Hawkeye Kate Bishop number 2. So with not too much more of the Disney Plus show to go, this is where you can continue getting your Kate Bishop picks. <laughs> this is just a miniseries, though. I believe it's a six-issue miniseries. And in this one, it starts out, and they haven't forgotten, um, you know, that Kate is a younger hero. So she's still texting. Um, she's actually texting America Chavez and Cassie Lang, which I kind of think by the end of the series, one or both of them may show up in mm. this because they've kept in communication. And she's letting them know what's going on, but saying, I got it, I got it. Yeah. So she's at this resort, Resort Chapiteau. And there has been a number of problems. Uh, you know, for one thing, her long lost sister is there, who she doesn't really get along with. Her sister had some jewelry stolen. But the immediate problem is there was a kidnapping. Like it was revealed right at the end of the last issue, there was a kidnapping. And so Kate's like, well, forget the jewelry thing. I'm going to go do that. <laughs> That's a lot more important. Um, so, what I'll say is the staff doesn't want her investigating. They're, of course, saying, no, we'll handle it, um, which she finds suspicious. By the end of the issue, the kidnapping will be resolved one way or the other. Um, and th the villain may not even quite be in complete control. And if, if they're not in control and kidnappings are happening and jewel thievery, who else in this place is not under their own control? And who's behind the whole thing? That's sort of uh, uh, some things maybe you could figure out if you read it. Maybe some will be revealed, maybe some will not. I can't reveal it all. So that's my quick summary of Hawkeye Kate Bishop number two. Uh, it's It's got a real light air of just the person writing it is having a very good time. Mm. 
You know, like Kate, you get to see her thought process. She'll think of the things that she needs to do, and then she'll cross one out, and you'll see it crossed out in the That's art. Cool. Yeah, it's stuff like that. It, it, it it's, fits the theme well. So we have the Stephanie Hans variant available for it this week. My next one is Gunslinger Spawn number three. So I've really liked this series so far, but um, I'll admit, like, not a whole lot has happened in it. We've had Gunslinger Spawn meet up with someone who uh, initially you think is just a guide. You know, he, he runs into him and Gunslinger Spawn doesn't know what's going on. So there's this kid and he's like, hey, what's going on here? Tell me about the modern day and all of that. But in, it turns Indoor plumbing. Out, indoor plumbing, we learned in the last issue. But turns out this kid, uh, his father has some weird ties with angels and maybe some uh, rough dealings. But this issue, we actually get uh, quite a bit more story. Um, really cool. So it begins with kind of our antagonists that have been hanging out for some reason in a museum of dinosaurs. Uh, not dinosaur bones, just like dinosaurs, which is, is pretty cool because this is drawn by Brett Booth, and I feel like he's always drawn dinosaurs, and they were just like, yeah, just put it in a room with dinosaurs. Um, but we are introduced to a new character named Dakota, and Dakota is someone um, from Gunslinger Spawn's past. Now, we don't really know what tie she is, but um, she's definitely uh, more than human. And you'll see later on in the issue how we know that. But she is kind of tasked with hunting down Gunslinger Spawn. And then back with Spawn, he, uh, we saw, I believe in Spawn Universe, that he actually has caches of weapons buried around. Well, now we're in the present day, and he has to go find those. Well, of course, some of them are covered in pavement and roads and sidewalks. But he finds one that uh, still has some of his weapons in it. But he is then confronted by uh, Dakota. So you'll have to read it to check out that part. It's really cool. I'll say um, some notes of this one. For one, it's the first appearance of Dakota. She's got a really cool design. You'll see her on the variant cover here in a second. But also, Gunslinger Spawn removes his mask in this. Mostly to eat a burrito. Um which he is very frightened by a microwave and how did it get the food so hot so fast with no fire. It It's kind of goofy, like it's got that classic spawn of of some, uh, some over-the-topness of it, but I feel like that's what kind of gives it some charm. But he removes his mask, and I will say I just, when I read this, went back and read the uh, two issues that were kind of the original Gunslinger Spawn story. And this is not the same guy that was in the original one. So I don't know if this has been revealed anywhere that this is not the same uh, host of the Gunslinger Spawn guys. But uh, we get his face in this and his name, which does not fit with the original one. So that may turn out to make, you know, whatever his first appearance in this was, the actual new first appearance of this new Gunslinger right. Spawn. Yep. If y'all know if they've brought up, if you read this one, if they've shown this character previously in, in the main Spawn series, but from what I could tell, we don't know. We didn't know who this guy was. So that's really cool. Um, that's new to me. Yeah. So we've got the variant. This is the uh, Brett Booth variant. You can see with Dakota right there in the middle. She kind of wears this big um, old West hat and everything. Really cool design. And also there is a kind of a last page surprise with, uh, again, kind of a multiversal um, version of a Spawn character that we know that uh, is pretty interesting. So great issue. I'll say probably the best issue of Gunslinger Spawn so far and probably a big deal that it's a different gunslinger spawn under the mask yeah i would have to go back and read yeah. maybe gunslinger spawn number one one of the backup stories if they talked any about this but um definitely when they reveal it he says his name there's a caption that kind of says 
he appears to look this way and be of this ethnicity and everything that's very like, oh, you're kind of saying this like we this is the first time we're right. seeing him. So, yeah, thing that people aren't really talking about, but a cool issue. Yeah, we, you know, we also go to a lot of comic news sites yeah. and everything. We try to keep up with everything. But the best way to know is is to read it yourself. Yeah. So often we read things ourselves and we find things that no one has uh -huh. talked about yet. And then a day or two later, yeah. it makes out there. And I bet that's one of those that is going to be making news in a little bit. So I, also from DC, I read Catwoman Lonely City issue number two by Cliff Chiang, which I have to say issue number one was really good. Really amazing storytelling really amazing art. I mean, he does it all. He did the cover, he did the interiors, he does the story. And issue number two is a great follow-up. So the premise of this, of course, is something really bad happened where a lot of heroes were killed, Batman included, and Catwoman went to jail for 10 years. That's the premise where issue number one starts. She's just got out of jail. So in this issue, it starts with a flashback to what happened. You don't get to see the whole thing, though. Uh, you know, Cliff Chang, he's smart enough to know, I'm going to dole it out yeah. a little bit at a time. But what you see is pretty important, and it's pretty cool. Um, you won't be surprised that what villain has something to do with it. Mm. But you don't get to see the full extent. You know, I when I was reading it, I was wondering, because this is a thick issue, I was wondering, how far is it going to go? Are we going to get to Batman's death scene and all that? No, it doesn't go that far yet. But... I think he's going to keep coming back to that issue after issue until it's all told. Mm -hmm. So right away, that's that's a really good angle. Um, but in the present, Selena, she is now a she's Catwoman, but she's you know in her fifties. Mm -hmm. And so uh, last issue, she kind of teamed up with Killer Croc. She found him. He was just sort of an old, washed up, uh, sort of overweight drunkard now. Well, the two of them have to train together because she's got a mission for them coming up, and you know they got a lot of rust to get out. Mm -hmm. So watching them try to train, you know, at that age is is you know amusing but also realistic. <laughs> uh, Selena also has a few meetings with a few other major Batman characters who are still alive in this story. But, of course, you get to see their older versions. So um, I was, it's really cool just to, I can't tell you who, but it would be a cool read to find out who those mm -hmm. are and see how they're being dealt with. Um, so ultimately, though, Selena is trying to put together a team to break into the Batcave. It has something to do with Batman's last words to her because something is happening there. You know, this hasn't been revealed yet. That needs to be dealt with, stopped. Uh, it's like, you know, it's Batman's last dying words. You know you got to deal with it. So she's putting together this team, and she's going to have it happen the very day that there's a re-election. And Harvey Dent's the mayor, and he has set his whole platform around um, secretly that he's going to capture Catwoman again and bring her to justice again, and that's going to let him win the election. So a lot of things sort of coming to a head all at once. So that's what's going on. But more than anything, it's just a really well done comic. The The story is clear. The parts that are funny are funny. The parts that are poignant are poignant. Um, Cliff Jang's just doing a fantastic job. And this is the sort of book just, I know I can tell everyone to read it and people just aren't going to read it. Yeah. You know, and it's a shame because it's really, really good. And not everybody likes the prestige format as well, mm -hmm. but he works well in it because yeah. the art is so cool. So that is my quick review of Catwoman Lonely City, issue number two. Okay, now time for another issue two. One that I have uh, loved issue one. I was very excited for issue number two. This is Robin's number two. The, uh, the prize winning of the vote for your which comic you want to get made book, uh, Robin's. And this is, uh, we saw in the first one that... The Robins were coming together to um, discuss: Is it uh, is it a good thing that there are Robins, or do they need to? I guess I guess their plan was like to get together and, and sit Batman down and say no more. I don't know what their plan was if they they decide there shouldn't be, but that was interrupted by uh, an attack, and come to find out, the person kind of claiming the attack is someone called the First Robin, or you know, they 
they say they held the title of being, uh, even before Dick Grayson, the first Robin. So this one is uh, definitely more, a, we get a little bit more in that story, but it's a lot of still talking about the Robins that are in this and their relationship to each other and their relationship to Batman. And what's cool in it, as they are looking for clues about this first Robin, they are recounting stories of their final trials with Batman. Kind of the, uh, Batman put them through tests, and these are the ones that were kind of the make or break um, final ones. And so each of them recount, you know, my final trial was this guy, and mine was this one, and, you know, Damien's was interesting because he was his son, so what was that? Uh, but it almost feels like the, those parts were narrated by Batman. They're almost like logs. So you, you know, the art changes a little bit. It kind of goes a little bit black and white. And you see almost what seems like recordings narrated by Batman of like, here's the things that I can put about this Robin. And here's the things that might be their weaknesses. Do they pass or fail? So that's really cool. But the other big thing in this is so I, we've seen it here and there but the idea of do villains have their own version of sidekicks you've got harley you've got punchline but uh true like kid teenager versions that uh assist with these um is explored in this so we meet a team called the junior super criminals which is really funny so you have the characters Giggles and Gaffal, which uh, if, you know, it doesn't straight up say like, if this is Jokers, this is whatever, but you, you do get an idea of who these are. So they're kind of clown characters. We have Kitten, which you can imagine who that is related to. Chick, which I'm not completely sure, but it is a man in a chicken costume, which is really great. And Honeysuckle, which has some... Uh, comparisons with Poison Ivy. So it's cool to see this kind of other group of young, this time villains, going against the young protege heroes. Um, but something happens at the end that's pretty frightening and will have some, you know, pretty big consequences, I feel like, coming up um, with some technology and everything. But it was a really fun issue. That's what the series is, is great banter between the Robins. Um, you even get... I feel like the first real um, talk between Stephanie Brown and Tim Drake, who we saw them break up, or I guess we didn't see them break up. It was done off panel um, in Urban Legends. And this time there's a note made about, well, you're the only two Robins who ever dated. And they have a, a discussion about that, which I thought was cool. You know, the, it's shows you this is tied in with what's currently going on in all of the Batman series. But really great issue. And oh boy, you get another one of these workout variant covers, which are just really funny. You know, the first one we got a uh, boxing ring, I guess, Dick Grayson. Yep. Sweaty Dick Grayson. This time we get all sweaty Jason Todd. Just finished his workout. It's actually pretty cool though. You can actually see he's got scars where he was, um, where they did, uh, uh, like, either surgery or when he died, they they pulled him open and stuff. It's pretty pretty interesting to see. Oh, these Robins got some pretty rough bodies after what they've been through. But, of course, another great issue of Robins. Um, I really hope more comes of the series after it's over, because I think there's limitless stories you can tell with these characters. All right, so... I read Joy Operations number two, the latest from Brian Michael Bendis' new series, which is over at Dark Horse. And so uh, Joy is our main character. She's one of our two main characters and the only one that we've gotten to see so far. <laughs> um, and I'll, I'll explain. So this is set in a future where I can't tell if it's the world or a country or a city it hasn't been uh, revealed yet, is run by these uh, conglomerates. They're called trusts. And the trusts have people who 
are their security, and that's what Joy is. She they they call her an envoy. It's spelled in a futuristic way, E N V O I. <laughs> and so she is just this like, you know, trained security person, possibly an assassin. You know, she, we haven't really seen all of the weapons and such. We just know it's the future, and she can jump around on buildings, possibly fly. It, it looks like she can't full out fly. Mm. So in issue one, the big thing to it is that something has hacked into her head. So these envoys, they definitely are somewhat um, part machine. You know, they're, they're mainly human, but they're augmented. Something's hacked into her and has told her, look, Joy, I'm controlling your body. Um, you're the only person that can get close enough to the head of your trust to stop her. She is a villain. She is trying to undermine all the rest of the heads of the trust. And she's trying to pretty much take over the world and possibly destroy it. Now, we get to see through other panels that Joy doesn't that this seems to be accurate. That the head of the trust, she does seem like an evil person. Joy doesn't know this. And she's fighting this voice off. That's kind of a lot of what happens in issue one. There's more than that. So issue two is more of... This voice trying to get Joy to agree to this, but of course Joy won't agree to this. She's tough. She's like, you know, think of like a military person. Mm -hmm. So she's like momentarily getting uh, her body back and knocking herself out <laughs> and trying to turn herself in. And I mean, it's a real struggle that I, I don't know how whoever this person is in her head thought this would be easy. It is not easy. That is what a lot of this issue is, is what would happen if you woke up and somebody's in your head going, hey, uh, you got to kill your boss, you know, and, and you like your boss. You may have to pretend that part. Um, you know, you're, you're yeah, not just going to roll over. Like? <laughs> <laughs> you're not just going to roll over and do what they say. So the other part of this issue is we get to see, uh, we get to go home to Joy's house and see what her family is like, to see what her life is like there, and to see what stakes she'll lose if, you know, let's say her boss discovers this. If, I mean, there, there's a lot that she has to lose here. So pretty cool second issue of Joy Operations. There's still a lot of questions that need answering, but there's only so much you can fit in yeah. each issue. So, you know, Bendis, he knows how to write. He knows what he's doing. Uh, at the very least, there's nothing boring at all about this. It, it clips along very nicely. So here is the variant for it. This is the Omin variant for Joy Operations number two. I hope some more people try that out. I know we have quite a few that have, but, you know, giving some, you know, not mainstream things a chance, like, you know, new number ones, sometimes it's hard when you don't recognize a character or whatever, yeah, but... get lost in the crowd, but, you know, Bendis, he, he writes a column at the end of each of these two, which I like when the writer yeah. does that, and he talks about how much he loves sci-fi and how he wanted to do a really good sci-fi series... Mm -hmm. And I believe him. I, you know, I just yeah. think with him, it takes it takes time. I've enjoyed both issues, but he didn't try to like pull you into the greatest premise in the yeah. world in issue one. Instead, this is building up mm -hmm. nicely. Cool. So my next one is one that uh, long-awaited prestige plus format. This is Batman One Dark Knight. I love how it's it's like. Boy, that Batman, he's a one dark knight instead of an IGHT. Um, so this is completely done, other than the lettering, by the artist Jock, who I guess now is writer, artist Jock. Um, and it's interesting, the solicitations for this are pretty dead on to this whole first issue. Um, just kind of beefed out a little bit. But this is about, um, in Gotham the GCPD and everything are attempting to move a lot of inmates from Arkham to Blackgate, which is the other um, less scary prison, I guess, in <laughs> Gotham. I don't know how you, how you differentiate them. One is just a little less like creepy old house on the hill, and one's like a more traditional uh, prison. But there is a new villain that is not like a... You know, this isn't the, their first time on the scene. They've been locked up, and Batman is very wary about them. So this character is called EMP, which, even with that name, you can already tell what their powers or whatever is going to be. It's going to have to do with electricity and technology. Um, but Batman's very concerned about the transport of this person. 
So we do get a lot of um, Batman talking to Alfred, you know, Alfred being like, hey, you just focus on this. I'm going to watch over the rest of Gotham to make sure, you know, if anything comes up, I'll let you know. But you can tell Batman is very focused. Now, the other story that's going on is kind of the, uh, the politics behind this move and the whole idea of um, these villains being put in Blackgate and is it a good thing? There's kind of a press conference about it that we see. Um, Renee Montoya is there um, kind of coaching this person who's, who's going to be presenting at it about this whole situation. So you do get a lot of, it's not just Batman, you get kind of the overall view of Gotham on this situation. Now, not a spoiler to say, because it's in the solicitation, but also this is a Batman comic, things do not go particularly well in this transport of this villain. But the thing about this villain is they've been locked up for a long time. They've been very uh, depleted. It seems like EMP gets his power from electricity and being around um, all of that, and they've kind of kept him in dampeners and everything. So he's uh, kind of dehydrated in the fact of he hasn't been exposed to all of that. So when he gets out, it's a very volatile situation. He's maybe his body's unstable to handle if he, you know, tries to get a hold of this uh, electricity. Um, but stuff happens. It's in the solicitations that a big thing happens and all elect uh, electricity and electronics in Gotham are wiped out. It is completely dark. You get a great two-page spread of Gotham just in shadows, basically. And Batman now has to transport EMP through the city. He, you know, because of this burst, he doesn't have the Batplane, he doesn't have the Batmobile, he can't talk to Alfred. He is on foot with a criminal thrown over his back. He has to traverse the city as there are um, gangs you know, waiting in the in the alleys to attack him, and that's kind of the setup for what this story is going to be. So, very similar to what the solicitation said for this story, but it's still really cool to see it fleshed out and kind of how all the parts actually come into play. A very interesting issue, great art. Um, I'm excited to read it. The next issue, because that's when we're going to get into territory, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, but you could tell, like, Jock had a blast with this. There are some beautiful images, especially Batman, kind of descending from the bat plane with his cape unfurled and everything. You're getting him uh, really getting to explore his storytelling abilities in this. So, very fun issue. I'm looking forward to the next one. Batman One Dark Knight. And then we have... And that was one dark cover. One dark cover. And here's another dark cover. This is the Cliff Chiang cover. So it's funny, both have their own prestige label, formats yeah. that they did uh, the writing and the art on. So, pretty jo cool. Jock owes Chiang. Yeah, he owes him a variant. Of Lonely City, except that Chiang, he, he even does his own variants. <laughs> okay, so I read Black Panther number two. This is the new series. They got John Ridley writing this. I really enjoyed issue number one. I gave it a very good review, and I also think this issue is really good. Um, it's once again very sort of fast paced. So we learned in issue number one that T'Challa has secret sleeper agents throughout the world, just in case. Just in case. <laughs> just in case. Uh, which is really, you know, that's pretty dastardly, mm -hmm. but you know, he thinks that the ends justify the means. And we're talking about pe that even the Avengers don't know about this. No one does. Well, in the first issue, one of these sleeper agents gets killed which tips him off that they have been made mm -hmm. so he has to bring them all in and when he tells people about this he tells Shuri about it in issue one you find out no one knew mm -hmm. I mean he knew the agents knew that was it this was some cars he was holding very close to his chest that somehow no one has found out so in this issue what happens when you get to see him talk to a lot of different sleeper agents all throughout the world. It's all done in several scenes, and they're different reactions. You know, some of them are happy to come home. Some of them are angry. What happens when some of them have been out so long that they're like, no, this is my home now. Yeah. You know, I, you know I'll help out Wakanda, but this is my home. And he knows they're in danger. He knows they know information that he can't just allow out there. He has to make some really hard decisions. 
Meanwhile, he has Shuri looking into the first assassination, and she, of course, uses um, her brain and technology to piece together some clues. Lastly, T'Challa will, in this issue, come mask mask. I can't say face to face because they're both masked with one of the people of the assassins. Mm -hmm. So you get to see what goes on there, find out a little bit about who they are. Not everything is revealed though. So, but a cool issue. I think my favorite part really was all the stuff with the sleeper agents mm. and how that was handled. It isn't just like handled quickly. Like, you know, they go into what that would be like for some of these people and how they would have different feelings about that. Um, I do have one thing to add. Uh, John Ridley's T'Challa, he is very untrusting, mm -hmm. I have to say, which is interesting. I don't think that's a bad quality when you're a world leader with mm -hmm. technology everybody wants. Um, to the point that he doesn't even trust the Avengers. Like, he's legit worried, what if the Avengers find this out? Well, I better go ahead and get some things ready in case we got to fight. Mm -hmm. And he's still on the Avengers. Yeah. So I, I think it's interesting, and I think that's where it's going. I honestly think that uh, Ridley's probably going to have it where it's him against the Avengers. I, I don't mean like to the death, but yeah. I, I think it's going to go pretty far. So we'll just have to buckle in and wait and see. So cool second issue of Black Panther. Here is the Lashley variant. Then we have the new variant. There is still the Liefeld Deadpool 30th Anniversary variants going on. I wonder if any of those are going to come out after the first of the year. <laughs> we're, get, we're getting close. Yeah. Here's the Scotty Young variant. He likes to pounce. Yes, he does. There is this Ooh. 1 in 25 Sway variant that we're selling for $25. That's all of them. Well... <laughs> the way he kept going. Yeah, like, this I know. Go I, I thought there might have been another, but... Really cool. Um, I like that idea of Black Panther. You know, you you look back at like the Silver Age of Marvel and everything, and a lot of the characters kind of had the same personalities. You know, they were, you had Captain America, you had Iron Man and everything. They were all just... Were heroes. Boy whatever. Scouts. Boy they're, Scouts they're, they're like Boy Scouts. And I like, you know, now we have characters like... Moon Knight, who's got his own issues, you've and you know bringing Black I'll Panther be, be like about that in a little bit. yeah, being like he's untrustworthy and you know well he he doesn't trust others yeah that's he what I mean yeah. is, well I guess he's semi trustworthy yeah <laughs> but just like let's give these characters very unique personalities that set them apart and then when they're in the Avengers kind of makes a, a more interesting melting pot of of you know, knowing what's going on inside their heads. He's a Wakandian first and an Avenger second. Yeah. So, you you know, but as the reader, you may or may not agree with that. Yeah, I, that's cool. So my next one is one that I think people should keep an eye out for. Um, this is a issue I, you know, I wasn't going to talk about, but then I remembered talking about the, uh, when we did Comics from the Future, talking about this issue of um, Legends of the Dark Knight. Let me find my notes. Legends of the Dark Knight number eight. So this is written by uh, Che Grayson, and the art is by Bellin Ortega. And you see on the cover, who's that character? So I remember in the solicitations it talking about um, the ghost dogs and their leader and all of that. So this is um, kind of a 50-50 issue. Half of it is this story, and I think this is kind of the uh, the big one. Um, for one, the art is great in this. It is really top-notch. It's super cool looking. But it is um, the first appearance of these characters, Ghost Dogs, who are a kind of a group, and their leader, Ghost, and they are thieves. They're kind of uh, jewel thieves and that kind of thing that... Their shtick is they wear masks, and when they, like, burst into a place, there's, like, smoke grenades, and they kind of look creepy as they come in, so it's kind of got the ghost idea. But um, Batman has been, of course, alerted to them with a major uh, jewelry heist from a jewelry store. When he tracks down their leader, which, of course, he's Batman, I mean, he's going to find them, and he confronts them, only to turn out that it is a pretty young girl who is the leader of these ghost dogs and 
Batman essentially is like, you know, you can't do this. And the girl's like, okay, go ahead and arrest me. And he's like, I'm not going to arrest you. And you learn some of the backstory of this girl and why she does what she does. And maybe it's not all bad. Maybe she's doing it, you know, she's doing bad things, but for a, a right reason. Um, but I want to bring this up because this character is very well crafted in this issue. The, her team of the ghost dogs and her as a character called Ghost and her look and everything and kind of Batman's uh, conversation with her and everything is very unique and well done enough where I think this is a character that could show up elsewhere. Um, so that's my main reason for talking about it is I think this character, Ghost and the Ghost Dogs, may be a little while, but I think is characters that will show up in something else. And people may be, go back looking for Legends of the Dark Knight number eight, you know. It's just, uh, you know, probably a 12-ish page story in it. But well done. Beautiful art. So be on the lookout for Legends of the Dark Knight number eight. All right, so I read Moon Knight number six, another excellent issue of Moon Knight. So last issue, a the villain from the shadows was fully revealed, and he did something very bad to Moon Knight's mission. This issue takes off right where the last issue ended up, where Moon Knight is like on the ground. There's, uh, you know, the villain is there. There's not a lot of good stuff going on. The villain fully explains, here's why I'm here. Here's what I'm going to do to you. Uh, it's looking very bad for Moon Knight. He's going to need some help, and somebody does get him help. And it is it, some unexpected help from somebody you, you wouldn't think would want to help him, and that Moon Knight probably wouldn't want their help either. So uh, I, I like that in the storytelling. It's real cool. But more than that... Um, there is a character whose relationship to Kamshu, Moon Knight's god, is further revealed. Now, this is a character who is newish to the series, if you've been reading this new series, and there's been a lot of questions about this character. A lot of people have been wondering, who is it? Um, who are they really? Are they a big deal? Well, if you read this, there are some confirmations about this character that are pretty big. That's a pretty big deal in my opinion. So this issue, I'm not telling you it's like a first appearance or anything like that, but there's a confirmation of a character from a previous issue of who they are. And you might say, oh, I suspected that or I thought so, but it's not confirmed till this issue. Mm -hmm. And I think it is a big deal for the mythos of Moon Knight. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe this also ends the first arc. It has a real like sort of, the story is not over, but like, okay, yeah, you know we we've finished this part of a story. Now where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. Sort of thing to it. But another excellent issue, and I'm glad they're going all the way with this new stuff they're adding in about Kanshu and Moon Knight. You know they had hints of it in the first few issues, and it's like, oh, are you going to really do that? And yeah, they they're they, they're doing they double it. down on it. <laughs> yes, which is which is cool. It's good. I think Moon Knight has a lot of area where you can expand his yeah. universe. And I think this series is definitely doing it. So we have the Raza variant. And then we have the 1 in 25 Libera variant that we are selling for $30. This has been a really just excellent series mm -hmm. just overall. Jed McKay proven again why he's yeah. so a force to be reckoned he, with. He's moving up the ranks in Marvel. <clears throat> So my next one, just going to briefly mention, we have Amazing Spider-Man 82 with this awesome cover, very reminiscent of like Nightwing with the with the movement through the building and everything. But uh, I will say, unless it was a tiny panel or whatever, Ben Riley does not appear in this issue. This is actually about Peter Parker. So all people, you know, maybe you don't like Ben Riley, but you got some Peter Parker in here. In the hospital. Spider-Man's adventures in a hospital. Uh, <laughs> Using his web to grab a <laughs> jello cup. Yeah, well, it's a... Uh, I mean, it's funny because it's kind of the superhero world. Um, this is a hospital horror story. This would have been really fitting around Halloween. 
but there is some uh, odd things going on in the hospital that Peter Parker has, is in, and uh, I don't know, I can't say too much more than that, but some very creepy um, figures appear and some scary stuff going on like in the basement of the hospital. So a very fitting if this was Halloween, it's not. So it was kind of fun to be like, oh, I haven't read a horror story in a few weeks. Um, fun issue, really enjoyed it. And also it has a really interesting variant cover. I'm gonna, you know, I if I did more research, I could probably figure it out completely. But we have this uh, Sway variant cover. This is the um, Devil's Reign or Villain's Reign variant. And it is Mary Jane, but who is she uh, dressing as? What's the the crossover here? We couldn't quite figure it out, so if you know who she is, let us know, but it's a very nice cover. Alright, from DC I read Nubia and the Amazons issue number three. So this book I, you know, I've read them all at this point, up to this issue. It is a really ambitious book in that it has a lot of characters. And I think they realize it in this issue because the beginning of it, you have a, uh, several conversations going on. And they write who each character is and a little blurb about them. And I, I think, you know, the, the writing team was like, wow, this is just a big scope. We got to remind everyone who all these people yeah. are and what their, what their deal is. And I'm glad they did it, you know, because comics, you know, they come out monthly if we're lucky. So uh, that's the first thing I'll say about this newbie issue. I'm glad they clarified some of that because even as I consider myself a pretty critical reader, I, it's been hard for me to keep up with all the new characters, all the new Amazons mm -hmm. that they have introduced. Um, so in this issue, Medusa's taken over one of the Amazons. This, this began last issue, and is trying to find her head, which, you know, was cut off by Nubia, you know, not in this series. Mm -hmm. And so what happens when Nubia discovers this, and they have to battle, you know, um, how's Nubia going to take out this person? Because it's not just any, Am any Amazon, it's one that Nubia's close to. And so, yeah, you can fight with her but you know that's still her body yeah so that's a lot of the the thrust of the action of this series past that you get more info on a lot of the new amazons that they introduced over the last two issues so here is the variant this is the jamal campbell variant next up we got some star wars we have darth vader number 19 so this is still uh, dealing with some Crimson Rain uh, fallout as Darth Vader, now that he knows that there are agents of the Crimson Dawn inside the Empire, it is his goal to eradicate all of them, hunt them down and get rid of them using a pretty uh, scruffy band of mercenaries that you kind of see in this, Vader may be picked because he's like, I don't know, they're really disposable. Like, I can just keep getting these people. Um, but they're interesting because in this one, we, we saw him kind of recruit them in the previous issue. This one, you get basically a roll call of um, one of, I think it's Ochi, his, you know, now Vader's, I mean, who's become a pretty big character in this, is like, wait, 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 who are you guys? Like, just tell me so I know what to call you. And you get, like, each of them like, I'm, this is my name, and... I do exactly what it looks like I do, which is what one of them says. But it's cool that, you know, they they spell it out so you get a good idea of the individual ones and what they're fighting for and all of that. But they have tracked Crimson Dawn to uh, some of the agents to a planet that they are, uh, are going to break into and find. But I'll say what they find is Vader realizes that the Crimson Dawn, I guess cells inside of the Empire go all the way to the top. So you'll have to read it to figure out what that is, but uh, it's funny because you know in this series Vader is never going to lose, so you just see his rage get higher and you just feel bad for the people. It's like, 
oh, you gone and done it now. Okay. He's going to come after you. But it's it's very fun to read because, I mean, whatever the situation is, Vader's just a little bit above it. So, really fun issue of Vader. We've got some variants for it. So, we've got a Russell Dodderman variant. Cool to see Dodderman doing a uh, Star Wars cover. We have the Sprouse Lucasfilm variant. This time for The Last Jedi. Got Snoke on there and Kylo Ren. Also wanted to show uh, Star Wars High Republic Trail of Shadows. This is number three. Really cool issue where uh, we actually get some pretty um, interesting stuff with Marchion Rowe as he suspects that there is a traitor in the Nile and uh, how is he going to flesh him out and you get some more internal monologue from him that I think is really cool. Also, you see him, you know, without his suit on. You get a good idea of what he looks like mm. un uh, scrap ironed or whatever. So, cool issue of um, High Republic Trail of Shadows. And we are out of the variant for that one. So, just the, uh, just the one cover right now. So I read the latest one shot in the Wastelander series. This is Wastelander's Hawkeye one shot. So uh, this starts out by letting you know that it takes place after Old Man Hawkeye, but before the original Old Man Logan series. Mm. So I, I'm glad that the writer is trying to keep some consistency as to, well, when is this? <laughs> um, so in this, Hawkeye, he... Um, is trying to save a village from some superpowered person who is sort of terrorizing it. Mm -hmm. He doesn't know who it is. And when he finds out, he finds out pretty quickly he might be outgunned. <laughs> this is a very powerful person. Like, you see this person, they're in the darkness of a bar, and you're like, I had an idea on who it was. I thought it was an old Spider-Man villain. Mm -hmm. And then when, it, when he bursts out, you're like, oh, crap, it's him. And Hawkeye has the exact same reaction that you, the reader, will probably have, or at least that I had. And so he's going to need help to defeat him, which he gets help in the form of his old trainer, who he doesn't really see eye to eye with, but this person trained him once he was losing his eyesight back in old man Hawkeye. Um, so, I mean, it's it, the, the trainer is stick. However, it's not the stick that you know from... The Marvel Universe. Mm -hmm. If you read Old Man Hawkeye, you'll know. But anyhow, so uh, this trainer, after the situation is resolved, he has one more mission for Hawkeye to go on. He says, you know, I haven't trained you for everything you need to know. You, you're still something you need to know. Do this mission and do this thing, and then you'll be done with your training finally. So Hawkeye, he does it, and that's what this comic is about. He goes on this mission. He does what he's told. But it's funny. It has sort of a surprise Sort of sweet ending. <laughs> yeah, it's like a surprise, happy, sweet ending. I didn't see coming at all. So, a good one-shot. That's, yeah. that's what I have to say. It's a good one-shot. You know, the Wasteland comics can be very, very dark. This one decided to kind of go a different way. So, I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was, was, a, was a good issue. So, we have this Mobili variant here. And you see he's standing next to... to um, Wastelander's Black Widow. Mm -hmm. She does not appear in this issue. I'll tell you mm. that straight out. Still a cool cover. Yeah. But... Okay, so it is time for the final installment of X-Men Trial of Magneto. Guilty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, funny enough, hasn't really been a trial this entire time. Not a, not a, um, an organized, you know, courtroom situation. But this issue does have pretty big ramifications for um, all of mutant kind. So I can't, of course, it's the final issue. I can't say too much without giving away a lot of it. We do know that um, for an issue, of, for a series about the murder of Scarlet Witch, Scarlet Witch has been alive and well in it uh, more than you would have thought. So what actually happened? We get answers to, you know what has been going on with there was a body discovered of scarlet witch um the whole time you know the last person to be seen with her was magneto that's why this is the trial of magneto um we find out was it magneto or was it somebody else you know uh the murder weapon and 
Uh, maybe some more stuff we didn't even know was going on. Maybe some uh, deals were being made and some plans were being hatched. But the trial and all of what's been going on leads to a pretty major um, advancement in the mutantums and Krakoan technology that can uh, take what they've been doing and push it even further, which is just still setting up the ultimate downfall of the X-Men at some point, it feels like. But a pretty major character makes a return to, you know, the universe. We'll say the land of the living in this issue. And uh, some uh, hints to what's to come, maybe some future books, what they will involve, and uh, maybe some more characters that are going to be joining the ranks of what mutants are around that before couldn't. So a uh, pretty big issue in that that regard. Um, I'm very upset I didn't get to see like Professor X with a powdered wig and a gavel at <laughs> any point in this series, but uh, maybe next time. So, uh, a fun wrap-up to Trial of Magneto. I'll be interested to see how, um, like, the main X-Men title will reflect this, if they will bring it up, some of the stuff that's happened, because, you know, some new characters may be showing up in some of the books. So, cool issue, uh, nice wrap-up for Trial of Magneto. I'm looking forward to this coming out in a collected edition to read as a whole to see if I can pick up any of the clues uh, in this murder mystery, but... Um, if you've been reading it, definitely want to pick up the last part of it. I have an addendum to make. Actually, this was the McNiven variant mm. for Wastelanders Hawkeye. And this is the Mobili connecting variant. So, I just noticed that last minute. Um, okay, so now I'm going to go over Kang, the Conqueror, issue number five. This is the end of the issue. Do that awesome cover, time just melting everywhere. It's really cool. Yeah, it's a great cover. This is not exactly what, what happens in the issue, though. <laughs> There's no gloopy Kang. So this series, no one knew what to expect, okay? Because Kang is a character. He has appeared in comics for decades and decades, but he himself has appeared as different characters. Yeah. Uh, you know, you add in time to the mix, and you have one character who can seem very different. And, and sometimes he's been a hero, and sometimes he's been a villain. I think this series has done a really good job of explaining why they why that might be but more than that it added to it you know like i kind of expected this would just say oh here's how it all makes sense instead it was added to with kang and his relationship with ravona that has been the central part of all of this is that kang loves ravona but they seem fated to never be together mm -hmm. and so of course this all started out because um, Nathaniel Richards, before he is Kang, is picked up by Kang in the first issue and told, I'm going to train you and you'll be the best Kang ever. <laughs> you know, I made mistakes, but you won't. Mm -hmm. and, but because of um, his love, he runs away and he tries to do things a whole different way. Well, by now, he has tried to... Um, He's tried relationship with Ravona in several different time periods, and it only worked out briefly in one, and that's the one that has sort of sparked him towards all this. Um, well, in this issue, he finally has a plan. He has a very big plan to kind of weave her throughout time to where she is an inevitability, <laughs> like she will always be back so that he can finally find one time period and one way that their fates can be together. But the question is, is this what Ravona wants? You know, Kang really hasn't consulted her <laughs> about this. He's pretty uh, in his own head. He, he thinks he's kind of the deal. And, and you know, if somebody keeps being woven throughout time, is there a chance they may kind of catch on eventually? Um, you know, like kind of understand their own sort of immortality? And so it, it goes into all that in this issue. And um, I, I don't know, like... I guess by the end of this, you'll get to see, has Kang figured out a plan to finally break his lonely fate, or is it going to further forge him into the cold conqueror that he has tried to run away from becoming? Really great series. It's got what I would call a cyclical ending to mm. it. Um, when you read the end, it's like, okay, yep, this is sort of a 
big circle, mm. which I think is a very clever way to write anything. Very Kang. With. Yeah. So, great ending. I recommend it. We are sold out of the variant. Wow. So, do you, is there any hints of how that might tie in with the Timeless book coming up? Mm, I don't think so. But I'll say, I think Marvel has a lot more plans for Ravona. Okay. So That's pretty cool. So my final thing, and sorry to be anticlimactic, because I didn't get to read this, because, I mean, this is a, uh, a pretty deep book. This is Radiant Black number 11. So I did skim through it, and that's when I was like, no, this one I need to take my time and read, because we... Uh, we get some more with the original Radiant Black, who, uh, did he die? Did he not? We kind of left that open-ended. Right. Um, his friend who took on the mantle, and then what's going to happen in the future. So, really, it seems like a really cool issue. I can't wait to read it, because it's been one of my favorite series coming out so far. Um, it's got some variants, so we have the Greco variant. This time with the pink... I guess radiant pink on there um but she doesn't really appear too much in it but it promises i believe the next issue is going to be like a one-shot story about her and then we have the gibson variant which is really cool looking kind of looks like a daft punk album or something but this is the one in 25 that we are selling to our customers for 30 dollars all right, so I read Darkhold Spider-Man. This is the second to last issue of the Darkhold one-shots. The one that will follow this is called Darkhold Omega, so you know it's over. <laughs> Marvel loves their alphas and omegas. So this is truly a nightmarish issue, uh, as most of them have been. In this, you got Peter Parker and Spider-Man, and right off the bat you can tell the world is kind of screwed up. And it takes a little while to figure out how it's screwed up. Something's happened called the unraveling, where just everything's kind of falling apart and decaying. People, buildings, just everything. And it's like a slow decay, but you can't stop it. Peter Parker is unaffected because he, the spider, he just heals <laughs> quicker, so yeah. he can't unravel. But this is affected heroes, people he cares about. Another surprise is that Peter is married to someone, and it's not MJ. Hmm. So you have to read to find out who that is. What links will Peter go to to keep the world together? And I'll tell you, what he does to keep things together is pretty ghastly. <laughs> it's pretty terrible. Uh, there's also Reed Richards is in this, trying to figure things out, and you will see the most disgusting form of Reed Richards I've seen in any comic ever. Oh no, I can only imagine some pretty globular uh, Reed Richards. You're, you're in the right direction, <laughs> so very, very disgusting, but there is a point to it. So uh, a great one-shot if seeing sort of Spider-Man's nightmares are your thing. And uh, there is this variant. There is the Casanova's Connecting Variant. I guess Wolverine could just uh, hang out with Spider-Man and they both regenerate as everything else unwinds. And... <laughs> I, I don't know if Wolverine would like what Spider-Man gets up to <laughs> in this one. Well, I'm all out. It's, a, it's, oh, it's you okay. again. Um, so, you could show these off. Okay, so... We have, okay, now I have to give it a little brief on myself, uh, some more of the Dynamite doing the homages to the McFarlane uh, Spider-Man 300 covers, so pretty cool. I feel like this one this works really well, because yeah. it's he's already a goofy character, yep. and this just fits. This was my favorite. So here we go, here's Army of Darkness. I think it's issue number four. It's Army of Darkness 1979, issue number four. Yes. And just the look on his face, it captured that Bruce Campbell face, and I don't know, you could the just see him. chainsaw as the web. Yeah, that's, that's cool. you could you could see you know him doing yeah. this goofy pose. Ash Williams. Uh, and then we have the one in eleven dynamite in their their. Uh, We're selling it for ten bucks. Interval numbers. Uh, so yep, this is ten bucks. Then we have. Someone who you don't expect to strike this pose. This is Barbarella, number six, doing her best impression. 
I like that the circle is now the earth on there. And then we have the uh, 1 in 11, black and white, for $10. So my last one to go over is from Bad Idea. I actually started our review show with the number one of this last <laughs> week, and I talked about how good it is. And I've been hearing that this comic has been selling for like $40, $50 online, the issue number one. So this is Odin's Eye number two. Man, I wish I could get comics weekly like this, you know? <laughs> Because uh, issue one was a double issue, had parts one and two. This is going to have parts three and four. If you think the cover art looks good, their interiors are just as good. I, I gave this a really good review of issue number one. I said this is a very well-crafted, well-written, well-drawn comic. Um, you just have to like, you know, sort of dark Norse mythology. So in this issue, this girl from the previous one, She's a young girl, and she had a vision of Odin that um, has put her on this quest. It's also made her go into fits of frenzy. She's kind of a berserker character, but she's a little girl, so it's hard for people to deal with her. In this one, we revisit her one of the most poignant parts of her life, which is the death of her parents. They were a big part of the first issue, and we get to see what happens there, what that does to her, and then that sends her off on a solo mission. Now, or solo quest. While she's doing this, she's also, we get a lot of thoughts to her and about her culture. She's talking about how all people have, um, can be divided into four components. There's the body, the mind, the fate, which I thought right away, it's like, great, it's not the ones I've heard before. <laughs> and the last one was a companion, that all people to be whole need, you know, good body, good mind, uh, you know, to, to figure out their fate and lean into that and also a companion. So I guess the question is, will she get a companion or will she not? Um, but just great story, great art, and it's not over. I'm not actually sure how many issues this is, but there is another issue coming out. I don't know if it's next week either. Yeah. It's a lot to keep up with in comics. Uh, so there's a backup story called Paparazzo in this by Matt Kent and David Lapham about a photographer who loves superheroes but also loves to take pictures of them when he's not supposed to that could reveal their identities that could be very bad and just his thoughts on why he does this and how he has rationalized both loving them but also you know he's got to do his job yeah you know they're heroes he's a <laughs> photographer so uh, another cool issue this is one y'all might want to look for at your stores because that issue number one just blew up mm -hmm. um, so that's the deal with that. So that is it. That's Pretty big week. Yes. That uh, was a big week. A lot of strong titles this week as yeah. well. So we know the holidays are right around the corner. Stop. Make a stop in your local comic store. Grab some of these issues. And you know what? If they're like us, there's probably plenty of presents and uh, stocking stuffers that you can grab as well. It's a a one to one. It's getting a little sticky right now trying to order things online. Yeah. Uh, I You've pretty much missed your chance if you wanted to come in before Christmas. Not to mention I bet more things go missing at this point yeah. than any other point, the poor stressed out postal worker. So it's gonna end up on your neighbor's porch. Yeah. And... More than ever, come visit your local comic shop. We appreciate it. If you shop here, Megan's got all kinds of treats and goodies she's given out to people for the holidays. So all right, well thank you. And we will be back Friday. That's right. We will be back Christmas Eve. We're doing that is a how comic dedicated we show. are. Like people don't even understand. We don't sleep. We just comic. <laughs> we we have limited hours in store. And Andy, and I talked about. And we're like, if there's comics to be <laughs> talked about, we're gonna do it. So we will see you this Friday on Comics Future. Until then, have a great evening. Go go read some comics.